Can you see my slides? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Okay. So <clears throat> let me first uh, thank the organizers for giving us the opportunity to present our work in this very nice conference. So I'm going to be uh, discussing constraints on the standard model from three different uh, anti-deciter Swamblon conjectures. And this talk is based on our work to appear with uh, Luis and Irene. So um, first I will describe, I will discuss the anti-deciter instability uh, conjecture, then the anti-deciter distance conjecture. And finally, I will talk a little bit about the refined deciter conjecture. So, the anti-deciter anti instability conjecture tells you that any non-supersymmetric anti-deciter vacua must be uh, metastable at best. So the idea is to consider the radian effective potential for the standard model compactified in a circle. It is known that uh, this potential has uh, anti-deciter vacua in three dimensions. If we assume then that uh, they are stable, which is something that will actually requires UV information, but let's say we do assume that, then uh, one needs to forbid this anti-deciter vacua if you want the standard model to be part of the landscape, which we do. Um, so as uh, shown in these works, the easiest way out is to assume that uh, the neutrinos have a Dirac mass term and that the uh, mass of the lightest neutrino uh, has an upper bound given by the 4D cosmological constant. So motivated by these results, we uh, decided to check whether other uh, Swablon conjectures, which require only uh, infrared information, could uh, provide the same, the same bounds or similar results. So some, some formulas that I will use, so this, <coughs> the dimensional reduction in a circle provides us with the definition of the radion and the effective potential that we will be looking at for, for this scalar field has uh, two terms. Uh, first, it has a, a, a term which, which comes from dimensional reduction of the, for the cosmological constant, which we determine uh, experimentally. And uh, uh, some quantum corrections that we, we compute at one loop, and they're essentially given by the dimensional reduction of the Casimir energy of the different particles in the spectra. And for this talk, which is need to consider the massless sector, which is uh, we assume it, it's only the photon and, and the graviton, and uh, some uh, well, and the, the lightest fermions are the only ones that contribute. In this case, the neutrinos, because uh, um, fermions with uh, which are more massive and all the particles which are more massive, uh, their their Casimir energy is exponentially suppressed. So we're just looking at the infrared sector. Okay, so the anti uh, distance conjecture tells you that if the cosmological constant of your theory goes to zero. Uh, then um, a tower of uh, states should come down with a, a power alpha of this cosmological constant, and this this power alpha should be positive. And in a strong version of the conjecture, it it was in the original paper, it was conjectured to be uh, greater or equal to one half, and the equality should uh, be ensured for uh, the supersymmetric case. Mm -hmm. So again, the idea is to consider the radion uh, effective potential for the standard model in a circle. And uh, according to the conjecture, if in some uh, direction of field space, the cosmological constant uh, goes to zero, then some tower of states uh, should, become, should become light. So we want to check if that happens. So in this plot, we have the effective potential for the standard model with the cosmological constant uh, fixed by uh, the experimental value. and we. Uh, Imagine that we can change the mass of the neutrinos. Okay, so all of the neutrinos we uh, multiply their masses by a constant factor lambda, and <clears throat> here we plot the result of the potential for different values of the lightest uh, mass of the lightest neutrino. So if the neutrinos are uh, heavy enough, then we have anti-center backward, which was already know. But the point is that we can by by changing the mass of the neutrinos by, by scanning along some direction in field space, um, the depth of this backward can uh, go to zero and become positive and the backward can even disappear. So if this was if this happened at an infinite value of R, so as R goes to infinity, and then you could argue that the Kaluza Klein tower from the particles uh, is, is becoming light in this limit. But since this is happening <clears throat> At a finite value of r, uh, the easiest so th this can be, of course, this can be violating 
the anti acidic district conjecture if no tower is, is coming down. So perhaps you can argue that some tower could come down, but since this is happening at the scale of the neutrinos, this is probably uh, puts you in trouble with, with experiment because tower would already have to be there in four dimensions before you <clears throat> dimensionally reduce. So the point is that the easiest way out is to assume that these anti acidic vacua they cannot occur. Um, this is what we do uh, in more detail now. I will go into a little bit more detail. Okay, so <clears throat> let me um, clarify the assumptions that we are making. So the first assumption is that it makes sense to scan along the, the neutrino masses so that there is a family of four dimensional uh, vacua exhibiting different values of these neutrino masses. So <clears throat> we are scanning, we're multiplying the masses of the neutrino in our scan by lambda. So lambda equals one would be the point, the experimental point. And lambda equals zero will be the point where all the neutrinos are massless. So we can think of this as changing perhaps the, the, the vacuum expectation value of the Higgs field or some Yukawas. The other assumption is that the point where all neutrinos are massless is also part of the landscape. So <clears throat> the, the kind of plots that uh, we, uh, we look at so that we obtain our results are these ones. So in these plots, the, the left-hand side is for Majorana neutrinos. The right-hand side is for the right neutrinos. Um, so as you know, we know the mass differences between the neutrinos experimentally, but we don't know uh, the order and we don't know the absolute scale. So uh, in these plots, I am assuming a normal hierarchy, uh, but similar results would be obtained for inver inverter hierarchy. And regarding the, the absolute value, so um, at lambda equals one, uh, each of the lines, the cut of its, the point where it cuts these uh, this, uh, uh, straight lines with a vertical line lambda equals zero, is the, the experimental mass. So this is the line for um, uh, the case where the lightest neutrino is three million electron volts. This is the line where the lightest, electro, uh, lightest neutrino has a mass of 6.6 .6 million electron volts. So if we are assuming that the standard model is in the landscape, then these points are in the landscape. And if we also assume that the point where all neutrinos are massless, so for example, we can think of this as the point where the Higgs bef is, is zero, if both, point, both points are in the landscape, so then we should be able to scan. Uh, and this line should not cross between the region where we have anti de vacua to the region where we, blue region, which is the region where we have the Sitter vacua and the green region, which is where we have no vacuum. And uh, if we compare both plots, we see that in the Majorana case, that for any line, we uh, would be uh, violating the anti de distance conjecture. So we, uh, the easiest way out is to assume that neutrinos must have a Dirac mass term, which provides each neutrino with four degrees of freedom. And it can be seen that this is enough so that uh, neutrinos, which are uh, not so massive, so in particular neutrinos with that such that the lightest neutrino with, with, with normal hierarchy is uh, lighter than 6.6 .6 milli electron volts, um, can, we, can make, uh, we can go all the way until the experimental value and we are not uh, going into the forbidden region. So this is how you arrive at the, at the bounds and the similar bounds from the anti de distance conjecture. Now, of course, uh, if, if you think about this, you can argue that I am assuming that during this scan, the 4D cosmological constant is not, it's not changing. So uh, it is fair to ask what would happen if it, if it changes during the scan. Uh, all we need for our arguments is that there is one vacua where, uh, where we find this violation so that we can put our bounds. Um, but let's think about more general cases. So it turns out this, uh, this uh, orange curve is the same as this orange curve. So this corresponds to the case where the for the cosmological constant is not changing to understand. And in these other curves correspond to cases where it is changing. So it turns out that in many of the cases, we would still uh, um, go into the forbidden uh, region before we reach the experimental value so that there, there is a still uh, an upper bound and it is the same upper bound in most of these cases. However, there are some interesting cases where the cosmological constant is changing uh, very fast during this, this scan. In particular, it's changing with a power uh, greater or equal to d, to the dimension, to four dimensions. Uh, in this case, uh, the point where all neutrinos are massless, uh, in, this, in the limit where you, all of the neutrinos are massless, 
you uh, all are always in an uh, anti-desert region. But it can be seen that in this case, uh, the backward that you uh, obtain are uh, attempting the limit uh, cosmological constant going to zero in the limit where R is also going to infinity. So the Kaluza Klein uh, tower of the neutrinos is becoming light. And uh, it can be seen that it is doing so with a power uh, of one third. Uh, so V zero is the depth of the potential, which is a three dimensional cosmological constant. Uh, but be, be careful because if the cosmological constant is going to zero already in four dimensions, then this means that uh, already in four dimensions, a tower should exist so that uh, so that the standard model is in agreement with the with the conjunction. Now, if we move on to the case of Majorana neutrinos, we find that regardless regardless of of how the cosmological constant uh, changes during the scan, we can never uh, for any mass we can reach the experimental value. So again, so this the the, the result that Majorana neutrinos are ruled out, pure Majorana masses are ruled out, is strong against this assumption. Okay, let's let's forget about the standard model for momentarily, uh, and consider the case where the 4D cosmological constant is zero. Let's imagine that this this, this case is, is interesting. Let's consider the case. It can it can be seen that even if the 4D cosmological constant is zero, quantum corrections can stabilize the radion and uh, generate uh, three-dimensional anti-desider vacua. And if we again play this game where we make the neutrinos uh, lighter. In the limit where lambda is going to zero, so where all of the neutrinos are, are becoming massless, uh, the, the position of the minima moves or goes to infinity. Uh, so uh, this is in agreement with the anti distance conjecture because, again, the Kaluza Klein tower is becoming light. And it is doing so with a power, this can be computed analytically, uh, it, the power with the, that the um, that the um, Kaluza Klein mass is becoming light is, is with one third of the of the three dimensional cosmological constant. So uh, result for this part, neutrinos must have a Dirac mass term. The mass of the lightest neutrino is bounded from above by the for the cosmological constant, and we find in some cases uh, that the consistency with the anti sitter distance conjecture requires alpha equal to one third, which uh, would be in disagreement with the, a stronger statement that alpha alpha has always uh, to be larger than one half. We are uh, generalizing this, so inspired by these results, we are in an upcoming work, we are generalizing this to uh, more general theories in D dimensions. Um, I'm not going to enter into much detail here, but we consider Minkowski, the Sitter, and anti sitter Pacwa, and some, some um, we, we start, we try to put uh, phenomenological, sorry, we try to put constraints, which can be in the phenomenological interesting, but we try to put constraints on the spectrum. Uh, the point is that we find is that uh, very often uh, light neutrinos or massless neutrinos are required. So like in the standard model, we have an argument that there has to be uh, light fermions, the, the neutrinos. This, uh, this, this the same thing happens in, in more general situations. And whenever uh, the KK tower is coming down, because it is required, uh, it always does it with, the, with a power one over D. So in the same as we obtain um, the same as was to obtain uh, before, and um, this is uh, I, th I think I I um, I forgot to mention uh, earlier that th this same result uh, of alpha one over d uh, was uh, obtained by Tom Rudilius uh, earlier in a paper earlier this year. Okay, so now for the last uh, two and a half minutes of of my talk, I'm going to consider the case where the standard model uh, is not described by a Descartes vacuum but by a runaway potential and we ask if, if this was the case, would we still be able to find this neutrino bounds? So to do this, we turn to the refined the conjecture, which tells you that in a consistent theory of quantum gravity, the potential should obey one of these two inequalities. But if we apply this to the sitter, to the sitter, the sitter vacua that I explained before that we find, uh, there's, we don't find any violation. So we want to apply it to the anti the sitter vacua. And it was already argued in the original paper that this uh, should be the case, that we can make this argument. So this is the reason why here I am including a, an absolute value for the potential. Okay, so um, for simplicity, we assume a single field for the quintessence field, and we assume an exponential potential. And uh, the, there's a, an additional term that appears from the Casimir energy of the quintessence field. And uh, we fix 
the uh, mass of this quintessence field in our, in our simple example, so that uh, the, the dark energy density today is uh, given by the experimental value. So we, uh, we uh, apply these bounds uh, to different um, values of the masses of the neutrinos, and we apply it at the, each, each of the anti-decider vacua. And what we find is that uh, the, um, both, of the, both of the inequalities uh, can be violated if the neutrinos are uh, too heavy. Uh, of course, the, the particular uh, value, the particular upper bound on the masses would depend on the coefficient C that we'll find here. Okay, now uh, my last slide. So uh, conclusions, we obtain similar upper bounds on neutrino masses from three uh, different anti decider formula conjectures and the existence of light and massless fermions seems to be a general requirement in many situations for the consistency of, of a d-dimensional effective field theory with quantum gravity. Thank you. Um, so this is the end of my part. Okay, so it was uh, really very nice, but we'll leave the questions after Lewis. Uh, Let's try again. Try again. Okay. Yeah, now it works. Yeah. So now it's PDF instead of keynote, but okay. Okay, so uh, okay, so I'm going to talk about pair production and gravity as the weakest force. Um, there are two formulations. Ah, but Lewis, now it, it's dark. Now, I don't, it was okay, and then it went. Yeah, dark. You, have to, you have to stop the share and resume the share. I see. Really? Yes. Or don't do full screen. But don't do full screen, right? I either one, yes. Well, I will do this then. So you, you see it now? Yes. I mean, okay. if you don't make it full screen, then we can do it like this also. Okay. So as I said, two formulations of the we gravity conjecture, one based on black holes and uh, the repulsive force conjecture which tells us that uh, when you have uh, two particles with the same mass and uh, opposite charge, uh, it is uh, the repulsion of uh, the Coulombic repulsion which wins. Yes. Now, uh, both formulations involve uh, U1 gauge symmetries uh, and uh, G equals to zero is a similar limit, but what about the scalar interactions like uh, quartics or the coupling of uh, moduli to heavy objects? Are pure, purely scalar interactions constrained by weak gravity, some sort of weak gravity constraints? And can one motivate, for example, the, the Sitter conjecture from sort of weak gravity conjecture arguments? And what about the lambda equals to zero uh, limit? Of course, in an equals uh, two uh, or more supersymmetry setting, <clears throat> one has lambda for the g square and the scalar couplers are obviously constrained. I'm referring mostly to what happens when it's equal to two or less. So uh, uh, this kind of uh, uh, question has been uh, uh, tried to be answered by, by Iran, our chairman, some time ago. And uh, uh, we are, my talk is based in this paper and there are also work by uh, other uh, people, some of them in, in the audience, I guess. So, um, so our proposal is to impose the principle of gravity as a weaker force uh, to purely scalar interactions as a Sumlang constraint. So in fact, uh, already our chairman proposed such a condition uh, saying that if we have uh, some modulus coupled to gravity, there must be some uh, weak gravity uh, conjecture states H with mass M such that uh, this, uh, this change of this modulus is, uh, the, the, this force is dominates over the gravitational force. So which leads to this uh, derivative constraint here. It's nice because sort of uh, suggests uh, that uh, it's consistent with the, 
for large uh, values of the field with a distance conjecture of large fines. However, um, this proposal doesn't uh, answer the, the, the questions I was posing about uh, uh, quartic interactions in scale. So one would need really to, to compare uh, things like uh, compare the, the coupling of moduli to heavy fields uh, with uh, gravity, gravitons to heavy fields or something like that. Um, so uh, let me come back now to the U1 weak gravity conjecture from the point of view of the repulsion uh, proposal. So that is based on the uh, uh, zero momentum uh, transfer uh, interaction between uh, charged particles. And then you have uh, a steady potential uh, Coulomb and Newton by the change of uh, virtual photons and gravitons. And what you're uh, assuming is that the uh, uh, Coulombic force should win. Okay. Now, but one could uh, uh, consider uh, cutting this line in here and uh, meeting these two together and uh, uh, consider other uh, particle physics process. Why not? Uh, it's, it's uh, again, uh, uh, um, it's just the, the pair production of, uh, uh, of particles, of charged particles at uh, a threshold, also low momentum transfer. Uh, this is a bit more complicated than the, this graph. Uh, uh, it is more like this. Uh, so the idea would say to impose that there must be some charged particle in the case of a U1 theory, such that uh, its per production rate from photons is larger or equal than the, its production rate from gravitons at pressure. So uh, these are the diagrams you would need to compute to do that. From This is the production from photons, and this is the production from gravitons. This, this uh, uh, computation is, uh, is tricky, but it can be obtained from previous results on the Compton scattering of gravitons in the literature. So uh, you can actually compare these uh, rates uh, at threshold. And uh, the condition you get from here directly is this condition uh, on the gauge coupling of the U1 and the, and the um, gravitational interaction. So you get the same constraints with uh, the, the particular factor of two here that in the uh, standard, uh, uh, the other two standard with gravity conjectures. So encouraged by, by that uh, uh, result, I would say, well, let us try now with scalars. So uh, uh, following the, the philosophy of uh, German, say, well, consider mass with scalars, moduli, and then uh, we wrote that there must be uh, a, a massive particle A so that its pair production rate from scalars is uh, larger uh, or equal to its production rate from gravitons. Then you redo the exercise. The gravity side is the same. Uh, the scalar, I'm doing it for a complex uh, massless and massive scalars. Uh, it comes from these diagrams and, and uh, you impose it. And what you get is this uh, differential condition. Um, this, uh, this is the, the first derivative terms came from these two diagrams in here. And the double derivative terms come from here. And uh, uh, this uh, may be generalized uh, to uh, n uh, complex moduli. And this is uh, uh, the constraint you get, which is uh, the scalar weak gravity conjecture, if you wish, based on the per production of, uh, of uh, massive particles. This expression has uh, some nice properties. In particular, it has a duality built in. So imagine. Uh, let us uh, write down the mass in terms of a uh, real function f of, uh, of the moduli. Then uh, this expression may be rewritten in this uh, simple form, very compact form. And this, this is obviously invariant under the exchange of f to minus f, which is the same looking at this as uh, m squared going to one over m squared. And this happens because of this absolute value. This absolute value comes because we are comparing rates, okay? So uh, that is an interesting property, sort of a duality. In fact, when uh, applied to a specific sample string theory, it is duality. And uh, in, in, this, uh, in this point of view, it appears uh, 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 nothing related with strings nor anything. It's just the, the uh, uh, scattering amplitude uh, in the effective field theory. Note also that it, it is a sonal constraint in the sense that if you send the plan scale to infinity, you are left with no condition, okay? which is what you expect from a, uh, a Swanland constraint. Now, uh, um, there is an Eastern theory example which uh, obeys uh, this uh, constraint I have just derived from the scattering amplitudes. 
which are these uh, BPS states, which appear in type two Calabria compatifications, uh, maybe type two A or type two B. It is dual is the same. Here I'm, I'm talking about the case of type two A. You have an N equals two theory, and there are BPS uh, uh, modes, uh, uh, particles uh, coming from uh, DP brain wrapping uh, cycles and uh, with masses given by these expressions uh, in terms of uh, the color moduli in this case, and these are the different intersection numbers. And uh, in the case of uh, the Calabi-Jau is just a toroidal uh, or before with uh, a C2 times C2 uh, twist. Uh, these uh, massive objects uh, have this expression in terms of the color moduli. And note, of course, that you get uh, this dual uh, behavior, which is in this case is a duality. In, in uh, well, you find that uh, these uh, particles saturate our bound. Um, and also, the one modulus Calabria examples are studied by many people in the audience. Um, they are saturated, in fact, it may be understood because uh, such n equals to theory is verified the special color geometry condition here. Uh, as um, described by Ceresola et al. and Ferrara in 95. And, and this uh, condition was also uh, brought uh, uh, to the community by Iran uh, in the year 17. Um, what set is the central charge in this case. Now, if you replace central charge by mass in here, and uh, uh, you get something sim very similar, not identical. For example, there is no um, absolute volume here. But uh, the, the fact that this is obeyed by this uh, uh, BPS states uh, makes that they, they saturate our own. It, it is uh, nice to, to plot uh, in this expression, to plot in a, in a plane, uh, the, the first derivative square of the mass uh, versus the second derivative. And then this uh, expression will tell you is that uh, there is a forbidden region in which uh, the gravity interaction is stronger than the scalar interaction. And then the other areas in here and in here, uh, what is the opposite uh, uh, is uh, happening. And these uh, examples I was uh, talking to you about of the uh, uh, difference uh, live in the in precisely in the boundary. Okay. Uh, when MP goes to zero, this forbidden region disappears. Okay? So this is a graphical interpretation of, of the equation here. Now, this gives us constraints on the of the mass of the massive objects. Uh, uh, but uh, tell us nothing about, uh, I don't know, the, the, the moduli. Eventually, this was all about massless moduli. And uh, let's uh, assume that at some point the moduli get a mass, and, uh, uh, and the, the, the potential for the moduli in, in comes uh, like a power of uh, 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 this massive objects, m of 5 to some power. Okay. This is, for example, what happens in the ADS distance conjecture. Now, Putting this back for the case of a single modulus in the previous expression, now you get an expression for the potential. And this is what you get um, uh, when you have uh, minima for, for vanishing first derivatives, you get a, a constraint on the second derivative piece, which is analogous to the refined the conjecture. And uh, uh, Again, let me do this uh, plot, interesting plot now. The interpretation is different. This is not masses now. These are first derivative of potentials. And so uh, first derivative square divided in here, second derivative square. And then there is a, a, a low region in here, and, uh, sorry, and, uh, and, and there, and a forbidden region, which gravity is stronger than, than the scalar uh, interactions. Again, uh, everything disappears when um, and plans go to infinity. Now, imagine you are uh, wondering about the existence of uh, the Sitter vacuum and assume that the potential vanishes uh, at infinity, like, uh, like in here. You know, if you want uh, the Sitter uh, minimum, and then you want that at the large uh, field, uh, the potential goes uh, to zero, then you will have also a maximum. Then uh, note that this uh, line in here corresponds to the minima and this to the maxima. So uh, you will have to go, if you go continuously from this to, to point to this point, you will have to go necessarily through this forbidden region. And so that uh, uh, that kind of uh, uh, potentials are going to be forbidden by, by this uh, equation. So in some way, uh, you get a, a decider uh, conjecture verified by this uh, constraint. 
So um, let me um, now consider and just um, uh, a, a different story now. Consider uh, uh, that, okay, we have uh, uh, some modulus, um, uh, real modulus, I'm consider now, a real, which uh, got a potential somehow. And then now let me insist that the interaction uh, is weaker than, sorry, stronger than gravity. I mean, I consider elastic scattering of, uh, at uh, low momentum transfer, so a threshold, so just a, a slow motion uh, elastic scattering of uh, uh, these uh, scalars, and compare it to the production of the same pair of scalars, uh, which are now massive in general, uh, from gravitons. <clears throat> Again, uh, you do the exercise, this is uh, for this single modulus case, this is the constraint now. Now, what you get is uh, triple derivatives, which appear in here, and fourth uh, order derivatives, uh, which come from the contact interactions. And this is what you get. Uh, um, you can try and see what happens with uh, known potentials like the action potential, where F is the, is the decay constant. And then one can just plug in it here. And you find that uh, uh, it is uh, obeyed as long as F is uh, smaller than MP in agreement with uh, other uh, derivations, uh, various type of derivations in, in Shramlam uh, <clears throat> literature. Or consider a, a quartic potential of a real field. It's uh, sort of Higgs-like. It's not Higgs-like because the Higgs potential, actually Higgs potential is a complex scalar with which is a doublet, etc. And there are uh, also uh, gauge bosons around, but okay, it is a uh, quartic potential. Then uh, you get uh, uh, that constraint leads uh, to this constraint in here, uh, which includes that the quartic coupling cannot vanish. Mm -hmm. So this cannot vanish. And in fact, for a zero uh, field, uh, the quartic coupling has to be larger than m naught square over mp square, which is sort of uh, what you expect of, uh, of uh, some sort of weak uh, gravity conjecture that the quartic coupling can never be uh, weaker than the uh, gravitational coupling. And there is also a, a, a further constraint, which I don't have time to discuss uh, here. So that was uh, essentially what uh, I wanted to say, but let me uh, summarize it all. So the point is that one may obtain the usual weak gravity constraint for U ones imposing per production from photons winds over preproduction from gravitons uh, threshold, imposing preproduction of massive particles from models stronger than gravitons, you get this uh, constraint, differential constraint, with a built-in duality due to this uh, absolute value here. And uh, okay, there are examples which saturate this, uh, this uh, expression uh, due to the special color geometry of n equals two uh, states in, in these examples. Now, if the potential has this behavior, uh, then you get something which leads uh, uh, to something very similar to the Desider conjecture. And, uh, uh, and uh, well, this is just what I said, and the case in which uh, one assumes that you have a potential depending on a single modulus. Now, uh, just, uh, just a, a final point, just uh, this perhaps may give constraints on the Higgs potential of the standard model. That, that I don't know. This is a famous plot of the Grassi in 2012. This is the Higgs quartic coupling uh, uh, of the standard model, uh, minimal standard model, uh, which is known to vanish at uh, some region in between 10 to the 8, 10 to the 10 GeV. So uh, uh, if these kind of uh, ideas are correct, that, uh, that cannot happen, something must uh, uh, occur in, in here before, like for example, supersymmetry. Super, supersymmetry, the, the self-coupling, the, the lambda, the quadric coupling is proportional to the case coupling. So this uh, never happens, but uh, coupling really is almost horizontal. So that's uh, something we should discuss. And that's all. Uh, thank you. And now. <clears throat> okay. Very good. Thank you very much. It's uh, very fascinating. <laughs> uh, um, okay. So I'm sure there are many questions, uh, both for Lewis and Eduarda. So uh, I think uh, Tim has his hand up first. So go ahead. Okay. So uh, thank you very much. It was a very nice talk. Um, and I have in principle two questions that are short, but I can also only ask one. But um, maybe for Louis, um, you had this plot where you showed that essentially you can't have a minimum and then a maximum. Uh, yeah, exactly this one. 
I'm wondering, does it also apply to ADS or like ADS plasticity where you kind of cross it's through also, zero uh, with the scalar potential? In this case, uh, it, it applies also to ADS. Uh, but this is, uh, one has to be careful, this is for a single field. Uh, right. But single field direct. I mean, there's this old paper where I'm asking is from Joe Conlon, I think, where he looks at LBS. And he says, if you add a correction, like an R squared or something, I don't remember, a cube term or something to the volume modulus. So LBS just has a, a, a ADS minimum. But he says, if you add a higher order correction, then you have a minimum in ADS. And then you do a small dip into the sitter. So you have a sitter maximum, um, which would be a single volume direction. OK, but in principle, you say, this would apply to something like a minimum in ADS plus a maximum in the sitter along a single field direction. As it is derived that applies in both to the sitter and the sitter. Well, I have to be careful because I have done the, 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 the computation actually in Minkowski. I mean, all the graphs that uh, I, I made were in Minkowski. Okay, so I, I'm assuming that uh, they, that doesn't distort very much. The, uh, it's not very far away from what you get. Um, in Minkowski. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks a lot. I just had real quick, like for Eduardo, just the the neutrino bound and everything you derive. What is the prospect for like experiments making progress on on the current bounds on neutrinos and maybe confirming or checking any of that? The the most most exciting possibility for us is that uh, our bound, our upper bound, is saturated. Uh, so for that, we would have to detect. Uh, soon uh, the neutrinos and so there are two things first of all whether they are Majorana or Dirac and that's an ongoing and another issue is to detect the to measure the mass so um, I would say that there are, I, I am not an expert in this experiment but I would say that there are ongoing experiments so perhaps in the next 10 years uh, to give you some time uh, they, they, they could be uh, confirmations of that but uh, if it's not detected, it's not an, a contradiction with the Swamblan conjectures. So our best hope is that our bound is saturated. Okay, thanks. Okay, very good. So, uh, Yuta, you are next. Uh, thank you for the nice talk. So I, I have a question about the uh, uh, role of the electron in the ADS conjectures. I, I mean, in the case of the instability conjectures, when one goes to higher energy, so electron is turned on, then the Wilson line potential arises, which can induce the uh, instability. So my, my question is that how, how about the uh, other two cases? So if one goes to higher energy and the electron mass is turned on, is there something interesting or new things happens? I, I think that, uh, so um, our, in principle, uh, all we care about is the infrared because yeah. That's all that uh, seems to matter. But uh, if you have pr provide an argument that some tower uh, could come down at the, this particular scale, uh, then uh, this can be a way out. So in this case, you would not have the bounds. But yeah. in principle, the information is about the infrared in this case. That's the difference yeah. with the other conjunction. But, but in, in any case, probably up to 100 GB or 1 TB scale, we, we know the standard model. So in principle, we can investigate the whole structure of the standard model. And then uh, it is possible to get a stronger bound, for example, the distance conjectures and the defined. What, what could happen when you study, when, when you go to higher energies than the neutrinos is that you generate new anti sitter vacuum. So if you generate them and you uh, can, you know, make, make sense to scan along the parameters, then you would get an additional different constraints. But you have to be careful because you are assuming that you can scan along the parameters. Yeah. So the, the more parameters you scan and the longer ranges, the stronger the assumption it becomes. For us, it seems reasonable because all, all we are changing is the masses of the neutrinos. And you assume that massless neutrinos should also be in the landscape. But in principle, you can generalize this to obtain more general results, yes. Okay, thanks. Very good. So next, I think, was Kamlan. Yes, <clears throat> thank you for very nice talks. Uh, my question is for Luis. Um, so this is actually the same page that it's on now, right? This is page 16 on the 
uh, is my question about. So D0, D2, D4, and D6 here are on the boundary of being okay, right? Here, if I understand. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, and this is, uh, you consider the case, did you, this was the leading contribution. You, there was no incidental corrections, correct? Uh, well, these are, uh, uh, these are uh, N equals two uh, BPS states. Right, no, I know, but you use the usual uh, large volume answers, if I understood correctly, correct? Use the T cubed and so on prepotential. Mm -hmm. So there is instant on corrections to these, of course. So since they are at the border of being okay, I'm wondering if you change. They should go, they should go in the direction you are saying, or not in the, the direction. The, the N equals two identity is exact. It yeah. It's not a large volume estimate. It's so exact. Which, what did you use? They use an explicit form of prepotential or not? That's my question. Did you use for these arguments? Did you use the prepotential? What prepotential did you use? The particular prepotential or not? If you go one one slide before, I think you mentioned. You mean uh, here? Here, you're writing cubic form. You see, you're writing cubic form here, right? So I'm saying that the prepotential will not be that in general. There will be corrections like e to the minus t corrections. So I'm asking if that if the contribution will change or not, or have you taken that into account? I don't know. I don't. I, I don't really know. Maybe maybe Irene or uh, Thomas didn't know. Uh, but the, the equation below is exact. The n yeah. equals two equation is exact. Yeah. No, that's exact. This one is exact. So you're not using a specific oh. form of prepotential? Is that the question? Is this is exact, and then, then it's true. Then it's going to be saturated, uh, and it would be a stable against the. Uh... Okay, so you're not using a particular form you have written? No, no. OK, that's fine. I'm Thank just you. saying that, that this n equals two condition precisely automatically fulfills our condition of time from scattering amplitude. Okay, thank you. And one more question to Eduardo. Mm -hmm. uh, so you concluded from various criteria of the swamp land that you're always getting some kind of light fermion as part of the necessity. Do you have any insight about what kind of, is there a general principle that you can bring it out from? In other words, um, I mean, this is not the, I mean, is there a further insight that you think it might be needed? I'll just give you a random thought, which is not necessarily what I, I'm going to advocate. But so the weak gravity conjecture says mass is less than charge for U1 gauge theory. So if you think about applying that to gravity itself as a force, <laughs> so it's a bit strange perhaps to say it that way, but you can think about the charge of a graviton corresponding to spin. Mm -hmm. So mass less than spin uh, kind of thing. So it would be like, OK, if you have a spin one half, maybe the mass is less than one half or whatever in that format which means that the, there should be something which is less than Planck mass, which is fermionic. Would, would you, are you envisioning some kind of a principle which is more directly gets to you, gets you to the point that there's a light fermion in your theory? Well, uh, thank you for the question and for the insight. Uh, at the moment, we have not thought about, uh, we, have, we were not so ambitious, but let me point out that uh, uh, it is not always that you require light fermions. It is, uh, it, we, this is something we are studying, like uh, how uh, general is it? So perhaps when we know exactly how general is it, we can think more about the origin like a, at a more fundamental level. Uh, so I, I, will, I will think about the, the, the possibility that you suggest if we can say something more concrete. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any more questions? Um... Yeah, I perhaps make a comment or a question. I don't know. Uh, you, you had this nice picture of the neutrino of the ADS vacuum when the cosmological constant was zero. Uh, mm -hmm. Then it looked a lot like the kind of vacuum that we get in string theory, where you get uh, an ADS minimum and the ADS minimum goes to infinity. I mean, uh, as, as it approaches zero, it also goes to infinity. And that seems to be always what we get in string theory. So, uh, and, and then you said that that satisfies the conjecture, which which mm -hmm. which is very nice. Uh, and then, um, but then, so then it seems to me that isn't that some kind of upper bound on the cosmological constant? Because well, if it's zero, then it seems to behave nicely. And presumably, the only mass scale in the problem is the neutrino mass scale, so it only can behave badly if the cosmological constant is too big. Is that am I is this misunderstanding? Or? But are are you thinking? Are you at first you were referring to the figure in Minkowski? Yeah, so in, if, it's, if you set lambda to zero, it looks like the ADS minimum behaves nicely, like it does in string theory. Uh, 
And then presumably as you increase the cosmological constant, it might start behaving badly. Uh, yeah, I, um, guess, I guess you can turn it around. You, you can think that it's an upper bound on the neutrino masses of if you think that the neutrinos have to be there for some other reason, then it is fixing you the value of the cosmological constant. So I, I mean, I'm not sure if that's what you're thinking about. Yeah, but the bound seems to go the other way if I think of it the way I did, because I don't know, because it seems to favor lambda. So for lambda equals zero, it looks like it behaves nicely. So for small lambda, it looks like it behaves nicely. So I don't know. Okay, uh, maybe uh, maybe I'm misunderstood. It's a, good or, point. a good point to think about. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's just that it, it looked like it behaved like it does in string theory when you set lambda to zero. So that, that's quite nice. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Sure. So any more questions? Um, so if not, we'll have the the, the final.